Very good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to ULAW's webinar on law office or legal office expense management. I kindly request everyone who's joined me today to mute their phone lines, and please do use the phone number provided for the audio. If you're connected by a computer, uh, we've often heard that the phone lines are of much better quality for audio. And uh, kindly use the chat window to ask any questions that you may have regarding the webinar or during the presentation itself. Today's webinar has been accredited for one hour of CPD credits, of professionalism CPD credits in the provinces of Ontario, New Brunswick, and British Columbia. So for friends and uh, colleagues and legal professionals joining us from these three provinces, today the webinar, Law Office Expense Management, has been approved for one hour of professionalism CPD credits. Okay? So what we're going to be covering in this next uh, one hour is talk about expenses that a legal office or a law office would incur, the two major categories that you can park these expenses under, namely your client expenses, that is disbursements, otherwise known as, as well as business expenses or office expenses that you incur to keep the lights on in your business and to run your office. Okay, So we're, we've kind of broken down the overall expenses that a legal office has into these two categories, and we're going to have a deeper dive discussion around the types of disbursements, the type of business expenses, how best you can capture them as and when they happen, and the tools and the opportunities that you have as a legal professional in today's day and age with the type of products that you could explore. Um, and we're going to just showcase ULaw as an example. It's only as an example that we're going to showcase the various tools and functionalities that you could purpose to capture these expenses. And then finally, we'll talk about the Law Society's requirements from an audit perspective, also from an ongoing record-keeping perspective the expectations from there, and we'll look at some of the reports, journals, ledgers that you need to manage and maintain as part of the expense management. Okay? Like every other webinar, um, EULA webinar, today's webinar has a very clear-cut agenda. So we're going to talk about, as I mentioned early on, the two major expenses, the client expenses, otherwise known as the disbursements, and the business or office expenses, We'll talk about how you can manage disbursements, the opportunity that you have to manage them between both the trust account as well as the general account. Okay. We'll talk about the types of disbursements, billables, unit rate, mileage, travel time, um, any outsourced work. We'll look at some of the examples around the types of general disbursements and, again, the expectations from the Law Society, the types of documentation that you need to prepare that reflect these client disbursements or expenses. And then we'll jump into the business or office side of the expenses. So your rent, your interest in bank charges, your meals, any gas expenses that you have, office expenses including printing, stationery, um, Law Society membership fees, any legal associations that you're part of, and associations there and membership fees there, insurances that you may um, spend on behalf of your firm, and how you would capture, manage, and maintain the office expenses. And we'll look at expense book, which is a very important law society document, how it manages and captures all the different components that touch it. And finally, we'll take you know maybe five to six minutes to showcase how a better understanding of your expenses, both from a disbursement as well as a office expense, allows you to be well informed as well as plan your firm's financial health better, including the analytics that you can drive around, the categories in which you tend to spend more, areas in which you can improve expense management, and things like that. Okay. Once again, kindly request everyone who's joined us today to use the chat window that's provided to you to ask any questions at any given time. 
and uh, kindly do use mute your phone lines and uh, reiterating for those who just joined us that today's webinar has been approved for one hour of professionalism CPD credits in the provinces of Ontario, New Brunswick, and British Columbia. Okay, so moving forward, I want to spend the last 20 minutes of the webinar to actually walk you through through a demonstration of how you would report and track these expenses. So I want to try and run through these slides and really set the context quickly. Um, and we'll start with disbursements. Talk about what is a disbursement and um, the definition that we've tried to derive from Wiki is the act of paying out or dispersing money, such as money paid out to run a business expenditures, dividend payments, etc., that a legal professional would have to pay out on a client's behalf in the connection with a transaction. Okay, so in simple layman's term, it's the expenses that have been incurred by your legal office on behalf of your client um, for a file or a matter. Okay? From an accounting perspective, fundamentally what happens is you need to record that particular transaction, like any other transaction, so that you are able to then balance the accounting, um, especially when you do a general disbursement where you're actually spending it up front and then generating an invoice to recover that expense. Okay. Bottom line from a law society's perspective, you are required to manage proper books that reflect these disbursements, including any HST that you may have paid. Okay. So disbursements are expenses incurred on behalf of a client which are recoverable. Okay. You have the opportunity to recover it. And also from a I would say a legal standpoint, you have the wonderful opportunity of exploring the use of both the trust accounts as well as general accounts to pay for these disbursements. And we'll look a little bit later on as to how using trust and or general, I would say, changes the way you recover that expense. In contrast, if you were to get a quick definition around a business or an office expense. It's essentially the you, the, you know, the act of paying out money um, to run a business. As I mentioned, examples such as rent, buying furniture or electronics on behalf of your firm's need, um, any dividend payments that, again, the business might have to pay out to run the overall business. From a layman's term, these are expenses that are incurred for keeping the lights on in your legal office. From an accounting perspective, you still need to manage and maintain this in your books to balance the accounts, um, including the taxes that you pay. You know That helps you um, manage your HST or your provincial taxes better. Obviously, in Ontario, it's the harmonized tax, but depending on the jurisdiction that you're in, it also manages the different expenses and the taxes that are part of those expenses. Okay? So very simple, we've got disbursements and then we've got business expenses. Disbursements are client expenses that are recoverable. Business expenses are not recoverable from client. They are mostly the expenditure that you have to run your business. And that's exactly what this slide states. Now this particular presentation will be available to you to review and refresh your memory um, as early as Monday next week. So just want to quickly reiterate that this entire presentation along with the video and the audio would be available to you um, by Monday end of day. Okay, so going back to really quick snapshot difference as I mentioned earlier, the disbursements are recoverable which means you will get back what you paid on behalf of your client and that's predominantly accomplished through the form of an invoice payment. Um, incur the expense generate an invoice, and recover the expense. And um, an important question also around disbursement is, why do you track them? Um, very important that you do track them, because if you don't, then you don't know how much you have actually paid on behalf of the customer, and it's hard for you to then recover, because that expense then automatically becomes a office expense, 
that you are now not able to incur back from the client. Okay, so you don't you don't want to miss out um, the opportunity for you to just recover these expenses um, and then becoming a bit of an expense to your business. Okay, as well as tracking these expenses, depending on which stage you are with regards to tax, it also allows you to better manage your provincial taxes. Okay, and we'll get into this a little bit later. Um, sometimes there are certain expenses, especially if you incur them through your general, that you may have the opportunity to include a bit of a profit margin, if you will. Um, if that's kind of your style of how you do it through your legal office because of the type of work that you do, then very, very important that you track these disbursements and record that transaction that happened in real life in a legal accounting or practice management software or any bookkeeping software. Okay. So let's first focus this slide share on disbursements and then we'll jump after we've done that to your office expenses and then we'll take the last 20 minutes to showcase how you would enter that into a legal accounting software. Okay. Now, how do you manage disbursements? What are the key steps? And as I mentioned earlier, you have the opportunity as a legal professional, depending on your style, depending on your firm, to use both the trust account as well as the general account to pay for the disbursements. Okay? So if you are a legal firm, if you're a sole practitioner, you're a legal firm, law firm, that basically uses both the trust account and you also have a general account, we're going to give you some points to think about about how you could, in different situations, utilize the trust account to pay disbursements. Maybe in some cases, use the general account to pay disbursements. Obviously, based on your style, you can make that determination of which works better. We'll kind of give you the pros and cons so that you can make an informed decision. Okay. So just so you know, you can pay disbursement out of your trust account, and it's just a slightly different style of how you would recover it, okay? But the bottom line, regardless of whether you use your trust account or your general account, here are some of the key components that you record and some of the steps that you take. First and foremost, you record the disbursements that was paid, how was it paid, and the reason for that expense, okay? So we call this the key elements um, of that particular transaction, okay, the essence of that transaction. So predominantly you have the date, you know, the method of payment, what was it paid for, right? Was it an application fee? Was it a court fee? Or was it just fax? It was it um, a lawyer's travel mileage? If you've had that a part of your retainer letter, maybe you're charging them uh, disbursements for travel. It could be any outsourced work. So maybe you had a, a stand-in, a paralegal that worked for you, and maybe that's part of the retainer letter that you will charge your client as a disbursement for any payments that are made out to these third-party consulting companies. So whatever the reason may be, you still have to capture the date, that is when was this paid, how was it paid, what was the method, did you pay through check, which account did you use, very important so that you can at the end of the month reconcile those accounts appropriately and the method so if you used the general account was it direct debit was it a check or if you used a credit card you know uh, tracking all of that or was it paid through cash in which case did it come out of your own personal money right and last but not the least the reason for it so we spoke about that so what is the reason was it a court fee or application fee so that it's easier for you to track and balance and reconcile at the end of a term. You definitely want to record the client's name, the matter or the file number that's associated with it. Okay? Because obviously this is a client expense, right? So you really want to match that expense to an appropriate client and more importantly match it to a particular file. And I emphasize on this because you may have a single client but be dealing with multiple matters or files for the same client. In which case, the expenses or the disbursement incurred are not 
specific to the client, but are more specific to the file itself. Okay? So very important that it's recorded for a client for a specific matter. And if paid from the general account, then you certainly want to decide which portion to invoice and to send to the client. Um, you obviously, as part of your general disbursement, you would first pay the disbursement through your general account or your credit card, your business credit card, your personal money. You actually pay for it up front. You would then track it. You would report it and include it to be a part of your invoice that you would send to your client. Saying, here, Mr. Client, on the 18th of July, I did spend $100 using my own money to pay for, or my company's law firm's money to pay for this application fee. I'm including this as part of my invoice because we agreed in our retainer letter that I would be charging you the application fee as part of my overall fee structure. And uh, kindly do the necessary payment within the stipulated time. Okay, that's the general idea. So very important that you do record that invoice and have a term, a day of sale, or a term that you should expect to get that money paid. Okay? So now let's look at some of the examples, some of the opportunities that you have, and some of the examples that we can illustrate about whether you use the trust money or the general money to pay for these disbursements. Pay it out of trust or pay it out of general, right? The common question. So why not pay it right out of the trust? And why we think some of these candidates are straightforward and simple is if you are not looking to make a profit margin on these disbursements, okay? Let's say you just don't want to have the burden of having to pay for these through your own money, then you can might as well include that expense as part of your initial retainer when you accept it from the client. So we have a lot of our lawyer friends or paralegal friends who after they've done the first, second, third matter within the same area of practice, get a very good sense for a typical fee structure for that same type of work. So they know there's an application fee of $100 that's involved and it's a $500 flat fee, so it's $565 including tax plus $100 of the application fee. So $665 is pretty much what a retainer letter would look like for, let's say, a slip and fall matter. Okay? And what happens is the $100 is going to the court anyways or going to the Ministry of Finance as an application fee. And uh, where we have it here is the court fee or any such fee is best paid to be paid right of trust because it's on the actuals. You can't make a margin on an application fee because you're, there are rules and policies that govern as to how much that fee is, right? The government decides that structure, the, the governing body, rather, decides what that fee structure looks like. So you can't charge less or more than that. It's on the actuals. So if the disbursement is on the actual, then the trust money is great to be used to pay off because you don't have to then report it in an invoice, and then wait for the client to pay it. You basically can just draw it right off your trust. It's actually taken right off the trust account. The only planning or pre-planning that would, we would recommend is included as part of your retainer over and above your fees. Okay. So when paid from the trust account, you don't have to recover the expense. And as I said, if it's, it's not your money after all, and Again, if you're not looking to make a profit margin and if you're paying disbursements on actuals, then the trust, uh, paying out of trust reduces the number of steps that you have to take, the amount of paperwork and bookkeeping work that you need to do as a legal firm to recover that expense. Okay? So at the end of the day, it does certainly reduce the amount of bookkeeping that's required. But let's say you're a you know, legal business that's not dealing with trust, predominantly general, then obviously you have to record the expense information, record the taxes, method of payment, matter, and client. All that remains to be the same for trust as well. But in the case of general, as I said, you then have the opportunity or have to make the determination whether um, there's a profit or a loss margin in that expense. 
And importantly enough, you do have to record it. Make sure that it's um, visible in your invoice. Generate the invoice, send it to your client, and then wait for them to pay that $100 of application fee as part of that invoice payment. Okay. So quick snapshot with trust disbursements. You don't have to generate an invoice. With general disbursement, you do have to generate an invoice and then recover that expense. So when do I recover disbursements, and how should I do it? As I mentioned, depending on the area of practice, depending on the cycle of the entire file, and specific nuances of the particular matter itself, the time in which you generate an invoice may differ. But a general thumb of rule that we've read about, spoken to, and have heard from the legal industry is generate an invoice on a periodic cycle that your client is aware of, that you've educated them on. Most often, do it as and when either a legal bill is available or a disbursement has occurred. Okay, so two things. Generate them as and when they happen if you have to, or if there's a certain cycle that you have set the expectation with your client. So let's say you're doing with a corporate client and you've set the expectation that they should uh, expect a monthly invoice or a uh, bi-weekly or whatever the term may be uh, within your retainer letter, then you obviously have to stick to that cycle uh, unless there's a, the odd anomaly of something occurring, which then you obviously educate your client get them to sign off on it, and let them know why that invoice has come about. But the bottom line, you still need to record this expense information with the date, the amount with the appropriate taxes, and understand that if you need to mark up or mark down. So let's say you've purchased a software, uh, such as a divorce mate or something like that, and you're going to be, you've done a lot of effort to go negotiate a, I would say, you know, a lesser price if you were to buy on a volume from different software companies. This is just an example. And then you're using those licenses across different clients. You may then decide to have a little profit margin because you've done your due diligence to go negotiate the price and you want to obviously be paid for it. Or another example would be a, um, a margin where you're having a loss. Is let's say you have a third-party consulting or a paralegal work for you and they charge you because it was a last-minute and you, have, you never had it as part of your retainer letter, you were supposed to go to court, you were unable to do so, and you had your friend who's a paralegal stand in on your behalf, you still need to pay them $100, but you may decide to not either charge your client fully or charge them maybe only $80. Okay? So that's another example where it's a markdown on the overall expense. Whatever the situation may be, track it, make it available with all these different elements of that transaction. Generate the invoice. Do a pre-bill if you have to so that you can review it. Make sure that it's perfect. There are no questions and your client would be certainly happy with the information in it. Generate the invoice, email it to them or print it and mail it to your client. And uh, now you can start to use different mechanisms to pay yourself. So either get paid from it by trust transfer. So if you've got trust money, then that eligible amount that you just generated as an invoice can then be moved from your trust account into your general account. If you're only using your general account and you did not accept any retainers, then obviously you have to follow up. Um, let's say you have a 15-day payment policy with your client, then you obviously follow up with them on the 13th or 14th day to just send them a reminder, send them an email asking them for a payment. Um, legal accounting software today can also include links within invoices that have an easy way for your client to just click and make a payment. So you don't have to even resend the invoice or um, makes it easier for your clients to do a bit of a self-serve there. Now, in the case where you've used your own personal money to pay for that expense, so let's say it was a 
fax that you had to send out, and then you had to go to Staples to actually do that fax instead of doing it from your office, and then you used your personal money, the cash in your wallet, to pay for it, then obviously you've got to move. Once you recovered that expense from your client, then you move that money into your own, in owner's pocket or your own money to pay yourself. And in doing so, what is important, going back to the compliance, is ensuring that you have, whether you're doing it manually or you're doing it through an Excel sheet or doing it through a legal accounting software, manage the journals and ledgers and all the transactions that are required to then reflect in these important compliance documents. Okay. All right, so one of some of the last few slides when it comes to disbursements that I'm going to share about, and then I'm going to jump into the office or business expenses. Types of disbursements and which ones um, are not a great candidate for trust, so we've kind of defined them both trust and general and, and only general, just to give you a broad example of the types of disbursements that you want to consider and the types of accounts that you may want to keep in mind. So if it's a billable, Right? You could use both trust and general, which means it's actuals, right? Any unit rate, only general, so fax, um, any of those unit rate, you know, photocopies, things of that nature. Mileage, general is the, the best candidate. Travel time, if you're going to charge your client for any travel time, general. So any recovery of expenses on actuals. Obviously, both trust and general are great candidates. If you have a trust, and as I said, pre-plan it, make it part of your retainer, and just accept it. Do the expense directly out of trust. Let's say a court fee, you can actually send the court a trust check because that $100, let's say, takes right, taken away right from your trust account. And what's left in the trust from that example of 665 is only the 565. Um, if you are doing a recovery of an expense with a profit margin, obviously it's only general. You can do that with your trust account. If it's an outsourced consultancy, it's on actuals. Again, you could certainly use both trust and general to do the expenses or the disbursements. But if it's a consultancy with a profit or a loss margin, then you would only use general. Okay, so I'll leave this slide share for just an extra few seconds so that when you review it as part of um, our recorded webinar, you would have a better understanding of it. Okay. Last but not the least, what are some of the documents that you need to report um, or report disbursements as part of certain documentation? Okay. So from an audit perspective, the disbursement ledgers and journals, both for trust and general, are important and they're, they are reviewed. The fee book with appropriate taxes captured, so your disbursements are part of that fee book. Trust ledgers, fee book, the general ledger, general receipt, trust disbursements, as well as general disbursements, journals. Okay? So we'll have a, a quick look at some of these examples once we get into a demonstration of the product. Okay. So that's everything that I wanted to talk about from a disbursement standpoint. I know I've kind of stretched it a little bit further, um, but I wanted to make sure that um, the audience get a better feel for the different flavors of disbursements. Now that we've spoken about the client expenses, so we're obviously just a quick recap, we're talking about law office or legal office expenses broken down into two broad categories of client related expenses or file expenses or client expenses, which are otherwise called as disbursements. And then you have the other side of the business, which is your office expense or your business expense that's used to run, your run the office itself. The key difference between these two different types of expenses is that the disbursements are recoverable. And then we spoke about using trust and or general accounts to pay for these expenses or disbursements, and some of the examples, the types of disbursements that you want to keep in mind when you consider either trust or general, the law society requirements from a disbursement standpoint, so your ledgers and journals, both for trust and general. Okay. 
And now let's move on to talk about business expenses. As a legal professional, I'm sure you'd appreciate that uh, you do have to wear multiple hats at different times. You obviously have to go to court to win that case for your client. But you also have to come back to work or come back home. You work out of a home office to deal with all the expenses that you incur. And many times if you're just getting started, I'm sure you've heard from other colleagues, um, early on you're just going to be incurring expenses because that's a big part of running a business, right? So when you just get started, you obviously have to prepare yourself to bring in a bit of capital or take a loan or take a line of credit. And what you do that for is to pay for some of the expenses that are almost mandatory, if you will. For example, paying for the Law Society's membership fees, very important. You've got to pay for it, right? Whether you pay monthly or one time, you still have that's an expense that you need to take into account. Pay for insurances, okay? If you are renting an office, then you obviously have to keep in mind you have to do due diligence, go, you know, figure out the rent, negotiate rent. But again, nevertheless, rent is an expense. Printing and stationery, you need paper. There's a lot of paper that's involved. As much as digital as you'd like to go, there's always going to be the need for certain um, devices and instruments, electronic gadgets that are required. You may need to purchase a laptop. Okay, so I'll quickly jump into one of the questions that was just asked. The name of today's webinar, for those who just joined us a bit late, is Law Office Expense Management. Okay, so that's what you can search for when you go into your provincial portal. Okay, so going back to business expenses, we spoke about many of these examples. You know, software that's required, a laptop or an electronic device, a mobile phone, rent, etc. Bottom line, all these are expenses that are incurred to run your business. Now, you can't, you know, charge your client for it directly, at least, right? You obviously then have to manage these expenses, understand the revenue that you're making, and then do a profit and loss statement, figure out how you're doing with business, and then maybe reflect to change your rate from $30 an hour to $60 an hour because that's what's more meaningful to run this business. So that's a different thing. But to actually transfer your office expenses, for example, let's say you purchase a printer. You can't charge your client for it. It's not a disbursement, right? So as subtle and as naive as that sounds, we've actually had a few clients actually tell us that they thought they could do it. That's why I thought it would be important to bring it up. Now, it's still important that you capture this in terms of documentation, the same journals and ledgers that you otherwise did for your um, client expenses. And why we do that is so that you can still have a reconciled general account. And that gives you the appropriate expense book. That gives you the appropriate documentation that goes to tell whether you had a profitable business or not. That also finally reflects in the taxes that you have to pay, both from an income tax or tax on your business's profit. All if you have a HST or a GST, PST, that also goes back to the taxes that you have to pay back to the government or wait for uh, taxes to be paid by the government to you. Okay. So just like how we looked at some of the uh, examples of client disbursements, again, I'll, I'll pause here and just read through it. I'm sure this is you know, something that you're already familiar with, but we look at, you know, if you were to categorize it, and this is one of the points that I'll probably like to drive, as much as you are aware of the different types of expenses, it would really help you in the long run, in the short run, in the medium run, to actually categorize your different expenses. Okay. If you're just getting started, obviously it's great to talk to colleagues. You know, you have software like ULaw or others that actually give you a bit of a head start with regards to key categories in this business. 
But if you're a seasoned campaigner, I'm sure you've done this over a period of time to recognize based on your style and your types of areas of practice that you focus, um, the types of expenses that you should expect. Right? So broad categories, office management. You can further break it down into printing, stationery, furniture, uh, gas, meals, etc. Rent and property maintenance, if that's part of your running your office. Corporate taxes, even bank charges. So let's say you charged the interest, um, you know, the bank fees, if you will, for managing for you're managing your accounts with certain banks. Those are expenses too. Salaries for your employees, and uh, any expenses to even pay back borrowings. Right? These are typical types of expenses that one should expect. I'm sure there's more, but we again, the point we're trying to drive here is categorize those expenses so that it's easier for you to not only track them, document them, but it's easy for, to then consume, measure, and then reflect on them. To say, if my rent over the last six months um, has been higher than what it was last year, and, if, I'm, and if, if that's actually hurting me, knowing that is going to motivate you to go look at rentable places with you know, with a lower rent, for example, or you may decide to actually open up a home office. How do you record them? So you're going to have a lot of business expenses that are happening in parallel. How do you record them? How do you track them? The simple answer we always give is record them as and when they happen. Okay. Have a mechanism, a discipline. I think that's the important word. Have a discipline to track and record these expenses, especially office expenses, as and when they happen. So you have great tools, you have internet, which our friends didn't have you know, many years back. You have mobile phones that allows you to take a picture of a receipt. You have tools that allows you to extract information right out of your bank statement. So if you can do it as and when it happened, great. Or if you're not that kind of a person, um, if you are more of a, a weekly person saying, I do everything during my weekday, I spend maybe two hours on a weekend to reconcile everything that I've done over that week, um, that's great too. So then you can use the appropriate tools that then, um, I would say, cater to that character of yours. Um, so bank imports, looking at bank imports and then being able to extract information out of it Making data entry faster is a great example. No matter how and how often you capture these expenses, again, ensure that you're capturing the date. Right? And what we again going back to the essence of that transaction or the key elements of that transaction. It's the same as disbursements, just that these are office expenses. So you still want to capture the date of expense, the name and title, and the brief description of that expense. You just don't associate it to a client and the matter in this regard. Okay. Categorize them as a type of expense so it's easier for you to reflect on them. The amount, including taxes. The method of payment, so that you know the account that you use to pay for it makes it easier to reconcile. And who did you pay it to? Right? Did you pay it to Best Buy? Did you pay it to um, whatever business that you paid to? Meals, Starbucks, Second Cup. And... Uh, how is it paid? Did it come out of your general account? Did it come out of your business credit card? Or did it come out of your owner's pocket, which is your own money? So we'll, after we go through the slide share, we'll, I'll definitely spend the, the last few minutes to go through a simple demonstration of being able to track disbursements and expenses and the different examples that we have. Okay? Whether it's done as and when it happens, it's done through bank imports on a weekly basis, or it's done through batches um, when you actually hand it over to, let's say, a bookkeeper that helps you. What are the documents that need to be managed? So most very important audit document is the expense book, the taxes payable, so whether it's HST, GST, PST, the payable statement, whether you need to pay the government or you should expect refund from the government. 
the expense statement, the profit and loss statement, and borrowings report if uh, it's meaningful. And we want to emphasize that so you've done all this heavy lifting, right? So you've done all the work, you've tracked every expense, both client and office expense, on time. You've done a fantastic job. Um, you've reported all the documents that are necessary for the law society. But then coming back to you to reflect on your business and how it's performing, what areas of improvement can you bring to the business? The analytics is what's going to give you that just-in-time quick snapshot of everything that's happening around your business. Okay, so we'll get into a bit of a demonstration to walk you through the analytics, but it's really going to give you a quick snapshot into the life of your business, tell you the different categories in which you're spending money, categories in which you're receiving money, you know, how much of recoverable expenses do you have in a month so that, you know, you can ensure that your credit card is paid off on time. Because if you're dependent on a credit card, and we've had this example many times, is a legal professional may be using a specific credit card which has a limit, and if they don't pay off that credit card, then you know they don't want to be embarrassed to not be able to use that credit card at, at an important disbursement opportunity, right? So knowing this and reviewing it allows you to be that empowered legal professional that you should be, so that you can improve and make your business more profitable, better, and more confident of a being a business owner, right? So at the end of the day, you are a business owner, but um, you know, the legal aspect to it is what you do for that business. And again, we'll emphasize on the benefit of a legal accounting software, whatever that you look to. Fundamentally, let's look at the benefit of a software because it's going to allow you and give you the right tools to track all this at the right time. Next, if you're looking as a legal professional, there are legal accounting software that allows you to capture both disbursements as well as client or office expenses within the same product. Right? That gives you the, the added flexibility of just using one product that does both for you, and it pretty much wraps the taxes together, which is a big plus, instead of having to use two different software or a manual and the software, um, and reconciliation just becomes not so much a nightmare, but reconciliation then obviously takes a lot more time. Okay, and then if time is money, then obviously that leads to more money being spent in reconciling your accounts, okay? And um, why not take advantage of tools that are available to you at a fraction of a cost, what it used to cost before, so that you can then take that well-saved time to do other things for your business or family. Um, from the sponsors, we at ULA Practice, we are a proud Canadian legal accounting and practice management software. Uh, we're based out of Ottawa, and we've been serving the legal community across Canada for several years now. Um, we want to thank everyone who joined us today in the webinar, as well as everyone who's voted for us as part of uh, Canada's Readers Award Choice Awards. Uh, we were recently nominated um, as a Canadian company in that category, and uh, we want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who voted for us uh, for those who don't know who we are, please, we request you and invite you to visit our website at ulawpractice.com. Um, and what we thrive is to make legal accounting, compliance, and business management of legal practitioners simple and easy. Okay, with that being said, with another 14 minutes left, in my clock at least, I want to spend the next 10 minutes or so to walk through a very pragmatic situation of how you would go about managing these expenses, both disbursements as well as office expenses. So just to make it interesting, let me first start with the office expenses. Okay, so and then I'm going to jump into my disbursements. 
So again, I'm using ULaw just as an example because we are more familiar with our own product, just as a way of demonstrating the concept, not so much the capability of the product itself. Okay. So if you really look at our, uh, again, we're a legal accounting software, and we manage the, the key chart of accounts, the core chart of accounts that's across internationally, the five ones, the assets, liabilities, capital, revenue, and expense. Okay. And we've created these different categories and different chart of accounts, sorry. And one of the important chart of accounts is my expense accounts. And we start off all our clients with obviously the fundamentals of the core expense categories, salary, consultancy, rent, taxes, up to payroll and benefits. For today's purpose and today's demonstration, I'll focus exclusively towards office expenses as an example. Maybe we'll throw in the rent as well. I'm using a practice account, I'm using a fictitious lawyer, Roger Moore, and I'm um, using a playground account that's used by all our clients to get themselves familiar and try out new concepts. So you could see they've obviously taken this and blown out all these different categories. So these are categories created by our clients of expense categories that are important to them. You know, you've got marketing, Jekyll expenses, printer, You've got Rogers, different you know, businesses, and uh, you've got membership fees as well. Okay? So as I mentioned, capturing things as and when they happened. Okay? So let's say you actually had a gas expense. One way of doing that is capturing it just after finishing up filling your gas, park it for an extra minute, or come back home, record it, write it down, but just come back to you and record it. And you can do that by just saying action, expense, office expense. And you can basically say it was an office expense, it was a gas expense, you know, for my business, because I'm using a business car. And uh, I'm just going to say it was Federal Canada. Happened today. Let's take a look at the quick example that I had. Yep. And I would say I used my general account and I used my debit card out of my business's general account. So obviously you have the opportunity of using a general account, any credit cards that you may have. These are placeholder accounts that are required to mirror your real life accounts. And I'm just using T D as an example here. And let's assume I used my TD debit card. If I paid this out of my own money, then I would use the owner's pocket to reflect that it was my money or my own pocket money that I used. For this purpose, let me just show you that I used a debit card. Okay? So on the 20th, as a gas expense, I paid Petro Canada $66.22. That's including tax. But we automatically calculate the pre tax and the tax. Very important, too, that we do calculate the pre-tax amount, and even better, calculate the actual tax that you would have incurred. Very simple way of reporting an expense. What this reflects is you can actually go and generate a compliance document, which is that of an expense book. And I will do that specific to the month of July. So this is the core advantage of legal accounting software, that as and when you do the data entry, the reporting capabilities of it is all inbuilt. At least with ULaw, it's just infused right into it. So as you enter data, the reports that are relevant from a law society standpoint are already built in, or meaning they're all you know, under the hood, already taken care of. So here's that business expense that you paid Petro-Canada. It's divided up with the 5860, the 762 of HST because this lawyer is in Ontario, and uh, that's the total, right? We put that data entry in, it's right there. Now, simple, easy, ask them when it happens, come in and put that expense in. 
So you want to put another expense, expense, office expense. You could say rent, right? And you can choose from the different categories. So I'm going to pay rent, and I'm going to pay Mattamy. This time, let me put the pre-tax amount. So I'm going to put $1,000 in my pre-tax. Automatically calculates the taxes based on the jurisdiction, right? And again, I'm using my TD. And this time, instead of a debit card, I then provided a check to Mattamy. So it captures, just as the law society requires you, when did this happen? What is the category for which it happened? Who are you paying this to? Right. If this was the disbursement, you would then capture the client and the file, which we'll get to. But in this case of an office expense, we're capturing who are you paying? I'm paying Madame Inc. Then comes the next question. How much are you paying and how much of that includes tax? So we know clearly you're paying $1,130 and $130 goes towards tax that you've just paid. Right? And uh, actually, we'll just say rent for the month of July 2018, I'll say paid to Madame Inc. And I will hit submit. Perfect. So you've captured expenses as and when they happened. If I go back into my compliance and do my expense book, you should expect that extra line item which now captures the rent as well. Rent for the month of July of $1,000 and the HST. So this is a great example of how you would enter and capture expenses as and when they happen. Now, there are the others who obviously all these expenses occur, right? There is a bank in real life that's all also capturing all these transactions because you're either using a check or a debit card or a credit card, and the bank is also ledgering all this information of money coming in and going out of their bank account. So what we've done at Yule Law, uh, and maybe you should expect the same with some other legal accounting software too, is we've given our clients the opportunity to import a bank statement. Okay? So let's say we come in, and say import bank statement. And I'm dealing with, we deal with many different types of uh, banks in Canada, uh, all the major banks as well as some credit unions. So let's say I bank with TD. And I want to look at my general account or put money into my general account. And instead of data entering it one at a time, I'm going to download a CSV file right out of my bank from TD for the month end of July. So basically, I download a bank statement for the month of July, and I just upload it right into ULaw. Okay? Now, what this does is it reads the transaction. It reads the entire file, it recognizes all the transactions that have occurred from the 2nd of July to the 20th of July. And if you've noticed, one other smart thing that we do is if you've already entered a transaction that matches both the name, the date, as well as the amount, we tell you right away that, Mr. Roger Moore, thank you, but you've already imported this expense, so you don't have to do anything here. You've already manually entered that. If you remember, we put that in manually, right? So we've actually done that in a very smart way to recognize, to avoid duplicate entries. So all you have to do is instead of having data enter them one at a time, you're just reviewing it and accepting it. So I, I paid $23.15 to Starbucks on the 2nd of July. It was an office expense we also automatically categorize them as a meal. So we recognize that if you want a Starbucks, then you know maybe it's a meal. You can always change it. You could say I, I purchased a gift or something like that, but 
If it's a meal, leave it at that. Hit submit and move on, right? Let's see, you made a mistake, just like how I did. I go back, I look at that 2315. It's not really a credit card. It was a debit card. Paid Starbucks. You can also override these transactions. Again, go back, import that bank statement into my TD account. I'm going to choose it. And you can do this on a weekly basis. You can do this on a monthly basis, depending on the total number of transactions that you have. Okay? Now it recognizes that you've actually had two imports already. Fantastic. So you can go to chapters. You can see office expenses. So on and so forth, making it that much more simpler. So let the actual transaction happen, and you then bring it into the accounting software to avoid any data entry automatically. So these are how you can bring expenses. Now, if you give this to your bookkeeper, or if you have your own accountant, or if you're using one of our bookkeeper accountants, you've, I'm sure, heard of the term the shoebox, where you have all your receipts in a shoebox, and you just hand it over. You don't even have time to do this. What bookkeeper accountants love is the ability to do the batch import. Or you give them the shoebox, and then they're just entering the expenses as and when they occur. Okay? So in a batch. Instead of doing it individually, you can have 10 and then import those 10 at the same time. That's another example. In doing that, what you've done is you've recognized that there are expenses to the business, and these are all the money that were withdrawn from my expense. What does this do behind the scene from a legal accounting standpoint is when time comes to reconcile, I'm going to hit compliance, and I'm going to hit general reconciliation, and I'm going to choose my appropriate bank account that I want to reconcile. You law or a legal accounting software automatically captures all those transactions so that you can easily now reflect and marry these transactions with the real life bank account. And why this is in green is it gives you the confidence that this particular transaction was reported through a import so you can be quite confident of the data that's been entered. So you can blindfoldedly say that I have now cleared these two transactions. Then you look at Petro-Canada and you look at your bank statement, perfect. Rent for the month, fantastic. Okay? So let's preview these transactions. That's another cool feature in new law is you don't have to generate a reconciliation report. You can basically Take a preview of these transactions. Okay. Okay. So I think uh, the next question is about the matter expenses. So let me jump into the disbursement. So we'll get into this when I finish my matter disbursement. So now that I've done, um, I've kind of shown you what the office expenses look like. Let's move on quickly to showcase to you also the other set of the expenses, which is the client related expenses or disbursements. So for which First and foremost, you create a contact or a client. 
I've op I created a, a dummy client, Brian Derrick, just a fake client, and I've created a fake matter called Flip and Fall, which is a small claims matter. And I'm actually going to take a retainer. Okay, I'm going to add a retainer of 565. And how I'm using the 565 is I'm going to provide a flat rate of $300 plus tax. And then I'm assuming there are two different types of disbursements, one from trust and one from general. Okay, so I'm going to put that retainer into my trust account. So right away, EULA understands that, you know, you've got 565 as a trust balance for this client. Let me go ahead and uh, say, all claims matter. I'm going to make this a flat rate, $300. So you can put, obviously, the work that you've accomplished. I'll hit save. Now let's go into the, um, there you go, there's 226 to the left. So I'm going to do a retain, um, disbursements right from my trust. Okay, so I'm going to withdraw from trust, where I'm paying a disbursement from trust. And let's say this is for $100. Written out of a trust check. And this is for an application fee, or let's say a court fee. And we spoke about actuals being a great example for a trust disbursement. And this was paid to, let's say, Attorney General, right out of my trust account. Okay? You can even print a check right out of you want. So I've just now recorded a $100 trust disbursement towards a court fee, which you don't have to recover through an invoice. It's taken right off your trust account. So it tells you right away the trust receipt is dropped from 565 to 465. And I'll show you another example where I'm using a general disbursement. I would draw from general account, and I will actually pay from general. And this I would do as an application fee for $126, all tax exempt. So it's not going to be charging it. And I paid it to the Ministry of Finance using my general account and writing them a check. Okay? And that's all you do. You create a file. Obviously, put the fees that are involved and capture the two disbursements. After which, the only thing left to do is generate an invoice. We recommend you doing a pre-bill, but for purposes of time, I'm going to skip it for now. I'm going to go ahead and mark this as paid. Generate the invoice. Download the invoice once it's available to be generated. And the only thing left to do is do the trust transfer of 465 from my trust account into my general account because I showed you the example of having accepted a retainer. If there were no retainers involved and if you're just going to be um, accepting a payment, then obviously you would follow up with your client within the next 15, 20 days to receive that. But because we received a retainer, this is money to be made. This is all the money sitting on the table for you to move. And this is where you're going to move the eligible 465 because the $100 disbursement was taken directly out of trust 
from the original 565. And it's moved from my trust account into my general account. And I do an electronic fund transfer. And that's it. With this step, you've basically done everything that's necessary for this file. And you can even fill a Form 9A, which comes pre-populated in ULA. Having done, done this, right, if I were to go back into my compliance and go back to my general reconciliation, you're going to notice that we've captured the deposits of the 465, the business expenses, but also the application fee that was more if you notice the difference, the key difference between these two expenses, one was an office expense, and the other one, which is the application fee, was a client expense for Mr. BD, which is Mr. Brian Derrick. And if the, you know, if this was paid using a credit card, then you obviously would use the appropriate account that was used. So, if you used a credit card to pay for it, perfect. You would basically say withdraw from general account. I mean, I just used the general account as a way of showcasing the appropriate account. If you used your general account, in the drop-down is where you would identify the appropriate account that you used. That was a question, is if you used a credit card, then you would tell us which credit card you'd used. Okay? The bottom line is we give the opportunity for you to capture all these expenses, ask them when it happens, and then the appropriate compliance, which is the trust, the general ledgers, the compliance documents. So I can do this for the entire month of July. Or just a click of a button. So compliance is that simple. If I were to do a trust receipt, I can do that. So every law society document that's required to be generated on a monthly basis from an audit standpoint is available to you at a click of a button, provided that you've entered the data, whether you've done it as and when it happened, or you've done it through batch import, whether you've done it through an import of a bank file. So there's obviously the flexibility of how you enter data, and once it's entered, there's the flexibility to generate these documents at a click of a button. That's the time that you save in not having to deal with all this. So here's Mr. Bean, that you're at ease right, I'm a different client, Brian Derrick of 565 that was received. And if I were to search for Brian, the clearance it tells you, received the 565, $100 went towards the disbursement directly from the trust, 126 was the trust transfer that was done, and 339 was the legal fees, okay, giving you a zero balance. And if I were to do my gender receipts, so again, um, I don't want to beat this beyond what it requires. The bottom line is all the legal law society documents are available to you. Not only that, because we're a legal accounting software, we also capture the taxes. I'm going to take HST as an example here, but you can do that for your PST and GST as well. At a click of a button, we generate for you the HST payable. Not only did we capture the HST that you received, so you received $39 from Mr. Brian Derrick as part of the $300 fee. You received $39, but you also paid $130 towards your rent, $7.62 towards Petro Canada. Right? We capture both, telling you that in this month, you owe the government $138. If this was returns, it would mean that the government, you should expect a return of HST back from the government. And the last document, and I'm going to close with this, when we do the balance sheet, trial balance expense sheets, but I'll do the simple expense book for the month of July, which clearly illustrates every expense touch point that we've dealt with this month, starting with the Starbucks 
which we imported as a bank statement, the chapters that we imported as a bank statement as office expenses. These were other expenses that we had. And then, then Mr. Brian Derrick, up $126, right? It captures all expenses that this legal office has had, both office as well as disbursements. And if I were to jump into my analytics, this is where I said as a business owner, you could take the weekend to review the data that's more meaningful to your business. So I want to know my expense chart by category, and I want to compare this with my last month. So I could say, tell me my June expense and where I spent it. So for the month of June, if I were to do a pie chart, I had about 63% on expenses on client account, which is great because these are recoverable. 20% of my expenses came through my rent. About 6% came through the law society fees that I paid, and I had to pay a law office to John, John for another 11%. Now, if I were to compare this with July, or actually, I'm going to do it monthly. Clearly says printing stationary, 27%. My rent's only 26%. So maybe something we did between the last two months to reduce the rent that gives you that pie chart of a lower expense. So this is how easy it is that once the data is in that software to give you the type of analytics and maps and charts that would otherwise take a lot of effort, manual effort to do, given to you by a software. Okay? So the key crux of today's webinar is having to deal with expenses, both from a client perspective as well as an office expense perspective, and how easy it is to use a software, even better, a legal accounting software, to generate, enter these data in real time and generate the appropriate law society documents as well as documents that are required from a CRA and a business management as well. Okay? So with that, I will close today's webinar. Um, if there's any questions that you have with regards to the webinar, please feel free to use the chat window to ask that. And I will keep the webinar open for a few more minutes to answer those questions. And we'll go from there. Thank you. Okay, that's a good question. If you're paying for meals out of your pocket, whether you pay it out of your, you know, it's really coming down to reporting the right account that you've used. So let's say you paid, um, you know, you had an office expense. I think the question is how do we report an out-of-pocket expense? So let's say it was a meal. So let's say you went to, um, yeah, you're paying from your personal account and you're paying to second cup or Maybe you went to uh, Moxie's and you paid $45 including tax. So you paid Moxie's, eh? Now, when you want to report your own personal money, as I've mentioned, in U Law we have this concept called this owner's pocket. If you go to the cash, you're going to see right at the drop down the owner's pocket and in fact in the description you can say personal debit card or you could say personal cash but by parking it under owner's pocket you're basically categorizing all the expenses for which you used your own money that own money could have been in any form personal money in terms of cash own money in terms of credit card personal credit card own money in terms of borrowing from your neighbor or your mother or brother or could have just been 
you know, debit card. You can mention it there. Uh, the petty cash and cash are just different cash accounts that we've created. It is used predominantly to park any cash that you receive from clients. So let's say you've got a cash retainer, and the cash account is a great placeholder account to park that incoming money. When it's outgoing from your own money, then it's owner's pocket. And then you just hit submit. Obviously, that reflects the owner's pocket. If you choose owner's pocket as an account, you would automatically notice that the particular amount that we just put in, $45, would be accounted for. There you go. Moxie's personal cash, $45. Hope that answered that question. Absolutely. So at the end of the deal, you just look at owner's pocket, and whatever is the amount there in negative is what the business owes you back. And you can do that end of the year. You can do that every end of month, end of quarter, whatever cycle in which you want to pay yourself back. We recommend that every business, if possible, have two business credit cards, one for office expenses and one for client expenses. Uh, and if that's too much, just at least at the least have one business credit card to manage all of your expenses. So it's just easier for you to track and manage. So if there aren't any more questions, again, we'll take the time to thank everyone who's joined me today for the webinar. It will be recorded and available to you um, by end of day Monday, and um, we thank you for joining us today, and have yourself a fantastic weekend. Thank you.